Pachulo. Uh, I live in Bridgewater, Mass. To see the passion by these uh, fans and to see the uh, players just feed off the fans is fantastic. My name is Pamela Gardner and my position is meteorologist at WBZ. winters are way, way worse than I would say most of the country. My name is Bo McIntyre. I'm living in Bridgewater now. Been here about 21 years. I grew up in the streets and I, for a while, I wasn't a very good person. I drank a lot. I fought a lot. I never had such a bad drive in my life trying to get home of, of, of that first blizzard. Uh, I'm a true believer that every team in New England is the greatest. Here you got it all. My name is Bo McIntyre. I'm living in Bridgewater now, been here about 21 years. A number of years ago I wrote a book and um, the first chapter is about South Boston and I think it will give the viewer a, a glimpse of life in the uh, Boston neighborhoods, especially South Boston. Most of us lived in tenements and there were no Never mind showers, there were no bathtubs in half of them. So everyone used the um, the courthouse for the public showers. <laughs> well, entertainment back then to us was made up games. We played in the street mostly, or we played up at the park, and we made our own rules for different types of baseball or football. We played tag rush in the street. and. Um, all our entertainment was was not um, it was not it was not run by anybody. We made up our own entertainment. Mm -hmm. There were no malls, mm -hmm. and um, when when you needed something big, like a, an Easter outfit for your kid, or uh, you had to buy a television, or a, actually. Not many people had televisions back then either. But if you had to buy a living room set or, or anything, you went to Downtown Crossing in Boston, which was only a 20 minute ride on a bus. And in there you had the bigger department stores like Sears and Raymond's and um, those type of stores. There was that park I talked about, M Street Park it's called. A friend of mine's father was a fireman and when the cold weather came in January, he would go up and open the fire hydrant and it would flood the football field and then that would become a skating rink. <laughs> I mean, it, it just, we, we were so self, uh, and we just took care of our own fun. And it was just amazing and nobody bothered us. You know, uh, you, if you opened a fire hydrant today, you'd get arrested, but... Back then it was just um, trying to open it up and then in the big snowstorms we'd be up skating on, on M Street Park and in the big snowstorms we'd skate down the street to our homes <laughs> because nobody plowed back then. Cities didn't plow the streets like that, they plowed the main ones and that was it. So um, we had a snowstorm that would last for three weeks. And, because everything was so contained within two blocks. You could get anything you wanted, basically. And um, with the parking problem, a lot of people just didn't buy cars. Crimes against society were another matter. Most people played the street number every day. For those of you who don't know, it's the lottery number now, but back then it was a street number that came out seven o'clock every night the newspapers would publish it for no other reason <laughs> that uh, to give people the number and um, 
it was uh, it was run by the mob and it was illegal and but had not the media published these 50 years earlier they would have put them out of business but there was some collusion between the media and the mob and uh, but the, the good thing about the number was there were numerous bookies who would take your bet including my father at times in his life the local bar room, the neighborhood store, and even the MTA bus terminal had a guy who would handle your action. There was even one bookie who went door to door. You could wager as little as a nickel, and if you picked three numbers in the correct order, you would get back $30. A dollar bet would get you $600, which was as much as two months' wages back then. The operation worked something, well, I won't get into how they, how they did it, but um, that number, and even now, I, I suppose, with the, uh, with the state lottery number, that number gives people a, a lot of hope. You know, uh, you, you hear the politician saying, oh, it's taking money away from the uh, the poor people and everything, but to some people that's their only hope of catching up a bill, of uh, getting clothes. I mean, it's just, uh, I understand both sides, but I believed in it and, and uh, I think it gave people something to look forward to. You don't have hope, you don't have anything. Yeah, I am. Um, I grew up in the streets and I, for a while, I wasn't a very good person. I drank a lot and I fought a lot. And, um, then I got married and had a child and once that responsibility hit me, I knew I had to get a, a job and support these people. Like, I've seen friends of mine try to stay on the corner hang on the corner and be married, it never works. They always end up getting divorced. So I went to the Gillette Company, which is a big um, employer of South Boston people. And I applied for a janitor's job. I got that and Gillette had a, uh, they used to post jobs on the bulletin board. You know, this job is open, You can, and just like you were coming from the outside, you put a resume in and, and, and get interviewed and, and, and see it. So within six years, I worked myself up from a janitor to managing the accounting department. I did it the hard way. I never had schooling, so I, I had to go to school nights I went to 10 years nights to, to uh, Northeastern and studied all weekend, which took a lot away from my family, but it was the only way I knew to, to you know, take care of them financially. Put a roof over their head and we were able to buy a house and, and it, got, it got us out of the city. And, um, I, I love Gillette, Gillette was my whole life. I mean, I, I worked there about 20 years, I think, and then I I burnt out and I went to another company and it didn't last long, but, but it, it had so many things that um, they offered. They had a, uh, they had a softball diamond that, was, that looked like Fenway Park. It was so beautiful, they kept it. Um, and, and right in the parking lot, you know, parking is at a premium. They kept that for years and years. They have a cafeteria where it was 35 cents for a three, uh, three course meal, 35 cents. Uh, if you were out sick, you could pay it for as long as you worked there. If you worked there for two years and you went out ill, you could pay it for two years. I went out with a heart problem and I got a, they gave me a raise while I, while I was out. I mean, you just don't see that anymore. Mm -hmm.
now it's uh, Procter and Gamble bought it, and now it's all temporary people. They don't hire a permit anymore because they have to pay the perks. And I, I've been in this house 22 years, and I became friends with the neighbor to my right, and the neighbor to my left. I don't think I've said hi to twice, and and all the time I've been here. It, it just seems as a, and it's not just here, it's, um, I say later on the book, when you walk down the street back then, you said hi to the person coming up the other way, you looked in their eyes. Now if you do that, people, uh, either scared or think you're crazy, or if you smile at them, they think something's wrong, uh, something's going on, you're, you're, you're after something, and back then it wasn't. And uh, there was just so much uh, politeness, and uh, if you went into any building, as soon as you stepped into a hallway of a tenement building, you took your hat off, an elevator, anywhere, Never wore a hat inside. Now I go to church and uh, the kids are wearing baseball caps all through the thing and uh, the worship service, everybody else, you know, and it, it's just, not, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's certainly different. Hi, my name is Pamela Gardner and my position is meteorologist at WBZ. Um, I've been working here since December of 2014. Um, I'm actually from Indianapolis, Indiana, the Midwest, and moved here in December of 2014. I had been um, professionally for five years a meteorologist. Yeah. I was used to tornadoes and severe weather and a little bit of snow in the Midwest and a little bit of cold, but then moving to New England, it was very different with all of the mountains surrounding, the ocean surrounding, and then all the effects that that would have on our weather patterns. So coming here, I've thought it was very challenging to learn how to forecast. We have all the extremes in New England. We have all four seasons. Sometimes we get all four seasons in a day. <laughs> it's amazing um, how different the weather patterns can be because we had a couple weeks ago 70 degree temperatures. Today it's windy, it's cold, it's brutal. Now we have more snow in the forecast. Sure, New England is very specific with nor'easters. We get that versus the hurricanes down south. Um, across Florida versus the tornado outbreaks that you usually see in the Great Plains or the Deep South. Now that doesn't mean we don't get hurricanes or we can't get a tornado outbreak, but it's just not quite as, you know, it doesn't happen every single year. Um, but here the winters are way, way worse than I would say most of the country. Now the Great Plains and Northern Plains states, you have terrible snow winters, um, terrible cold and stuff, but here in New England we get the, the nor'easters that can really pack a punch. Yeah, the blizzard of 78 was just unbelievable and uh, people don't remember, but I think that was on a Friday on a Monday before, we had a blizzard that was almost as bad as 78. And uh, we had two back to back to back. In fact, the, the first blizzard I couldn't get home. There were cars just stalled on the expressway and you couldn't see, it was white out and you're trying to get around them. And, and my, I remember my alternator was gone and if I stalled, <laughs> I would have been there for a week. But the blizzard of 78 was just unbelievable. But what came out of that, I, at that time I lived in Hanson. I've never seen people come together like they did during that blizzard. Everybody was out helping shovel. We would take a sled and walk down to the supermarket to get food, and every night was a party. I mean, it was... <laughs> Especially for someone who's passionate about weather, I love the challenge of the forecast with 
the different seasons, just trying to get it right, especially this time of the year. We're trained to think it's spring, it should be warm, it should be in the 50s, maybe the 60s, but then here in New England specifically, we'll be stubbornly colder than the rest of the country. And that to me, I think it's fascinating. And if you grow up here in New England, that's um, something nice that you would have as opposed to someone who grows up in the South where maybe you've never seen snow before. I think it makes you tougher. Well, we love living here. Um, we're beach people, my husband and I, and we actually bought a house on the beach because we love the space and just the different atmosphere it gives. It's a very unique part of the country where you have a melting pot of cultures too, coming in from Boston Logan. Um, we lived in Chelsea first and loved it there with the different um, food options, restaurant options, even the market basket there was different versus where <laughs> we live now. I mean, seriously. And you don't necessarily get that much exposure to culture in the Midwest. Um, you do some, but it's, it's a whole nother ball game here. I think the uh, four seasons make it specifically great for this uh, region. Uh, the summers, I enjoy summer because I'm outside a lot and I do a lot of exercising outside. Uh, I'm involved in a Let's Go program that we still do, that I still do. That's great for the summertime. Winter, people are out there skiing, they're out there uh, doing a lot of winter sports. Spring, the kids are out there doing a Little League Baseball. In fact, uh, my last year, they asked me if I could throw out the opening pitch to Little League Baseball, and I said, great. And I had one of my former uh, students in the background, uh, Eric Hackinson, yelling out to me, way to go, Bobby! So uh, it was a great to see people who I taught back in the uh, uh, elementary grade to come back, and now here they are with their own kids doing it. So, uh, and the fall is just fantastic. Uh, I, I'm a, I took up golf, so I'm golfing now during the uh, fall season, and it's great getting out there without the crowds during the week and hitting a golf ball and seeing the leaves change, and it's just a great time. Well, coming from the Midwest, we, people made fun of me like, oh, learned how to interpret the Boston accents, I learned moving here. Not everyone has the Boston accent. Um, and it's a very pinpointed location of the state where you have that accent. Another thing too is I was told Bostonians aren't very warm, welcoming, friendly. They're more hardcore, maybe like a New Yorker, but that is completely wrong. Um, with what we've noticed moving here, Everyone's very friendly, very nice, normal. It's not some, oh, different, crazy part of the world. <laughs> but um, the culture is different. You have more seafood, fishing culture. That's a big deal here, which I was never exposed to. Um, yeah, it's fun. Advice for anyone too, definitely move somewhere and learn a whole new part of the country. All right, my name is Bob Chulo. Uh, I live in Bridgewater, Mass. I taught in West Bridgewater for 35 years, and I've been retired now for five years. I grew up in Fall River, Mass, and that's kind of where I got my sports uh, influence from. Uh, it was a great sports town. The name of the school was called Durfee, and they had an awesome basketball program. Uh, I'm a true believer that every team in New England is the greatest that's on the face of the earth. Uh, I particularly like the Boston Celtics, uh, the Boston uh, Bruins, the uh, Boston Red Sox, and uh, New England Patriots. I went to the Boston Red Sox first with my family back in 1964-65. And I fell in love with the 1967 Boston Red Sox, which is known as the Impossible Dream Team. Then during the years of uh, high school, I attended some uh, uh, Red Sox games with my uh, friends. Uh, in college, I uh, got involved with the Boston Bruins. Uh, one of my roommates was an usher, 
so uh, he kind of got me into a couple of games. Uh, the Boston Celtics, one of my good friends, uh, Chris Churchill, uh, he would get me into games. I was at the game when uh, Michael Jordan played against Larry Bird, and Michael Jordan went off with like 57 or 60 points that game. I don't know the exact date. And then another friend of mine, Charlie Underhill, uh, back in the 90s, he got me involved with the New England Patriots, and he would take me to a couple games each year. And I was at one of the games where the Pittsburgh Steelers beat the New England Patriots in one of the playoff games. It was a cold, cold day. So that's kind of uh, where I am with the teams. Uh, just every game that I go to, I just uh, feel the ambiance of the whole stadium, the whole inside, outside games. Uh, it's a great, great uh, town to, uh, city to grow up in. And to see the passion by these uh, fans and to see the uh, players just feed off the fans is fantastic. Uh, watch, I probably watch mostly every Celtics game and my uh, wife watches probably mostly every Bruins game. In fact, she was at the Bruins game when Bobby Orr scored that uh, fantastic goal in overtime to win the Stanley Cup. Uh, she would go every game with her parents when she was in high school, and that's one of the things that uh, she has done that I'm kind of jealous of. It's interesting because one of my good friends uh, now lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and he tells me constantly, you don't know how good you have it. Uh, every single year, your teams are right in it. Every single year, the fans are passionate about it. Uh, you go to the Celtics games and you hear the chants going on, even in the pregame shows, the New England Patriots with the tailgating, the Bruins fans all dressing up with their Bruins gear, and the Red Sox, well, nothing like Red Sox Nation with Jerry Remy. Being in a big sports town, we have all the big sports. I mean, hockey, baseball, that I didn't have in Indiana. We had football and basketball and stuff, but um, here you got it all. Yeah. And the teams are good, admittedly good. <laughs> I think the teams have changed over the years because uh, uh, the teams obviously are, are very good each year. So if you're good each year, you're gonna have the uh, internet showing a lot of the games. You're gonna have cable television, which is unbelievable. You can get every game now. Uh, you're gonna have the uh, newspaper coverage of the teams. And I just think that the, that the fans are more passionate nowadays. Uh, whenever you see uh, the grocery stores on a Sunday during New England football uh, Patriots Day, the fans are dressing up with the shirts, they're buying the uh, food, and it's just a great, uh, uh, a great time for the people to be involved with football during that time of the year. Well, I have to say that uh, Larry Bird is my all-time favorite player. Uh, one of the things I'd like to accomplish on one of my bucket lists is to someday meet Larry Bird, uh, even just a handshake or just a picture with him. Uh, that would be awesome. Uh, my next favorite player is the uh, gentleman, uh, Bobby Orr, who just had a birthday yesterday, in fact. He turned 69. Uh, for the Bruins, Patrice Bergeron has to be one of my favorite players. Uh, and for the Red Sox, probably uh, you're gonna, a lot of people are going to be you know, saying, why him? But Nomar Garciaparra. Uh, I just like the way that he played back in the day. And now he's uh, a commentator and he's doing a good job. Um, I was, I knew some of the sports crowd. I, I'm not saying he was my friend, but I did have socializing with Bobby Orr. And, um, in fact, most of that Bruin team from the, that, those years, the Orr years, they used to hang around in South Boston in these bar rooms. And, and in fact, they bought two of them. And, um, a guy named Jerry Moses who played for the Red Sox, I, I became really friends with. 
I'll tell you, my uh, friend uh, Charlie Underhill, who uh, got me into a few games a couple years ago, now the tickets are very hard to come by. He has gone to, I think, every game uh, since the uh, dawn of his tickets, which is over 40 or 50 years ago. And I think he's only missed one game in all those years. So he goes, and with him, he has a rule too. He makes sure to get to the game and he's there for the opening kickoff and he stays right up until the end of the game. He doesn't leave for snow, sleet, rain, blowouts or anything. So uh, the, the uh, clientele who go to these games are just passionate about uh, their teams and uh, they follow them for uh, through th uh, thick or thin. Uh, I just uh, make time. I uh, just enjoy the uh, seeing the championship teams develop. Uh, my wife's a big sports fan, so that's one of the reasons why uh, I can s uh, spend a lot of time watching sports. Because, in fact. I must admit, she probably is more of a baseball fan than I am. I will go to bed and I'll go to sleep and she'll stay up and watch the games almost to the end. And uh, football, the same as with her. And now my kids have gotten into uh, fantasy football and they want me to join and I'm not into it yet, but I think eventually they'll kind of pull me into fantasy football. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years, we have had a domination of uh, championship teams from the Patriots to the Bruins. In fact, my wife and I went into the Bruins parade when they won the Stanley Cup in Boston, and that was an awesome time. And just standing there and seeing thousands of people and screaming and yelling for these athletes on the duck boats. And so that's what makes it nice for me that uh, hopefully uh, if the Bruins or the Celtics can get into uh, a championship team, hopefully my wife and I and maybe our kids will go in to see another parade. Thank you.